This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain, Chapter 18. Tom reveals his dream secret. That was Tom's great secret, the scheme to return home with his brother pirates and attend their own funerals. They had paddled over to the Missouri shore on a log at dusk on Saturday, landing five or six miles below the village. They had slept in the woods at the edge of the town till nearly daylight, and had then crept through back lanes and alleys and finished their sleep in the gallery of the church among a chaos of invalided benches. At breakfast Monday morning Aunt Polly and Mary were very loving to Tom, and very attentive to his wants. There was an unusual amount of talk. In the course of it Aunt Polly said, "'Well, I don't say it wasn't a fine joke, Tom, to keep everybody suffering most a week so you boys had a good time, but it is a pity you could be so hard-hearted as to let me suffer so. If you could have come over on a log to go to your funeral, you could have come over and give me a hint some way that you weren't dead, but only run off. Yes, you could have done that, Tom, said Mary, and I believe you would if you had thought of it. Would you, Tom, said Aunt Polly, her face lightening wistfully. Say now, would you if you'd thought of it? I, well, I don't know. T'would have spoiled everything. Tom, I hoped you loved me that much, said Aunt Polly, with a grieved tone that discomforted the boy. It would have been something if you'd cared enough to think of it, even if you didn't do it. Now, Auntie, that ain't any harm, pleaded Mary. It's only Tom's giddy way. He's always in such a rush that he never thinks of anything. More's the pity. Sid would have thought. And Sid would have come and done it, too. Tom, you'll look back some day, when it's too late, and wish you'd cared a little more for me, when it would have cost you so little. Now, Auntie, you know I do care for you, said Tom. I'd know it better if you acted more like it. I wish now I'd thought, said Tom, with a repentant tone. But I dreamed about you anyway. That's something, ain't it? It ain't much. A cat does that much. But it's better than nothing. What did you dream? Why, Wednesday night I dreamt that you was sitting over there by the bed, and Sid was sitting by the wood box, and Mary next to him. Well, so we did. So we always do. I'm glad your dreams could take even that much trouble about us. And I dreamt that Joe Harper's mother was here. Why, she was here. Did you dream any more? Oh, lots, but it's so dim now. Well, try to recollect, can't you? Somehow it seems to me that the wind, the wind blowed, the, the, try harder, Tom. The wind did blow something. Come. Tom pressed his fingers to his forehead an anxious minute, and then said, "'I've got it now. I've got it now. It blowed the candle. Mercy on us. Go on, Tom, go on. And it seems to me that you said, "'Why, I believe that that door. Go on, Tom. Just let me study a moment. Just, just a moment. Oh, yes. You said you believed the door was open. As I'm sitting here, I did. Didn't I, Mary? Go on. And then, and then—' Well, I won't be certain, but it seems like, like as if you made Sid go and, and, well, well, what did I make him do, Tom? What did I make him do? You made him, you, oh, you made him shut it. Well, for land's sake, I never heard the beat of that in all my days. Don't tell me there ain't anything in dreams any more. Serenity Harper shall know of this before I'm an hour older. I'd like to see her get around this with her rubbish about superstition. Go on, Tom. Oh, it's all getting just as bright as day now. Next you said I weren't bad, only mischievous and harem scarum, and not any more responsible than, than, I think it was a colt or something. And so it was. Well, goodness gracious, go on, Tom. And then you began to cry. So I did. So I did. Not the first time, neither. And then? But then Mrs. Harper, she began to cry, and said Joe was just the same, and she wished she hadn't whipped him for taking cream when she'd throwed it out of her own self. Tom, the spirit was upon you. You was a prophesying. That's what you was a-doing. Land alive. Go on, Tom. Well, then Sid, he said, he said, well, I don't think I said anything, said Sid. Yes, you did, Sid, said Mary. Shut your heads and let Tom go. What did he say, Tom? 
He said, or I think he said he hoped I was better off where I was gone to, but if I'd been better sometimes— There, do you hear that? It was his very words. And you shut him up sharp. I lay I did. There must have been an angel there. There was an angel there somewheres. And Mrs. Harper told about Joe scaring her with a firecracker, and you told about Peter and the painkiller, just as true as I live. And then there was a whole lot of talk about dragging the river for us, and about having the funeral Sunday, and then you and old Miss Harper hugged and cried, and she went. It happened just so. It happened just so, as sure as I'm sitting in these very tracks. Tom, you couldn't have told it more like if you'd have seen it. And then what? Go on, Tom. Then I thought you prayed for me, and I, I could see you and hear every word you said, and you went to bed, and I was so sorry that I took and wrote on a piece of sycamore bark, We ain't dead, we are only off being pirates, and put it on the table by the candle, and then you looked so good laying there asleep that I thought I went and leaned over and kissed you on the lips. Did you, Tom? Did you? I just forgive you everything for that and she seized the boy in a crushing embrace that made him feel like the guiltiest of villains. It was very kind, even though it was only a, a dream, Sid soliloquized just audibly. Shut up, Sid. A body does just the same in a dream as he'd do if he was awake. Here's a big Milam apple I've been saving for you, Tom, if you was ever found again. Now go along to school. I'm thankful to the good God and Father of us all I've got you back. That's long-suffering and merciful to them that believe on him and keep his word, though goodness knows I'm unworthy of it. But if only the worthy ones got his blessings, and had his hand to help them over the rough places, there's few enough would smile here or ever enter into his rest when the long night comes. Go along, Sid, Mary, Tom. Take yourselves off. You've hindered me long enough." The children left for school, and the old lady to call on Mrs. Harper and vanquish her realism with Tom's marvelous dream. Sid had better judgment than to utter the thought that was in his mind as he left the house. It was this. Pretty thin, as long as a dream is that, without any mistakes in it. What a hero Tom was become now! He did not go skipping and prancing, but moved with a dignified swagger as became a pirate who felt that the public eye was on him and indeed it was. He tried not to seem to see the looks or hear the remarks as he passed along, but they were food and drink to him. Smaller boys than himself flocked at his heels, as proud to be seen with him and tolerated by him, as if he had been the drummer at the head of a procession, or the elephant leading a menagerie into town. Boys of his own size pretended not to know he had been away at all, but they were consuming with envy nevertheless. They would have given anything to have had that swarthy sun-tanned skin of his, and his glittering notoriety, and Tom would not have parted with either for a circus. At school the children made so much of him and of Joe, and delivered such eloquent admiration from their eyes, that the two heroes were not long in becoming insufferably stuck up. They began to tell their adventures to hungry listeners, but they only began. It was not a thing likely to have an end with imaginations like theirs to furnish material. And finally, when they got out their pipes and went serenely puffing around, the very summit of glory was reached. Tom decided that he could be independent of Becky Thatcher now. Glory was sufficient. He would live for glory. Now that he was distinguished, maybe she would be wanting to make up. Well, let her. She should see that he could be as indifferent as some other people. Presently she arrived. Tom pretended not to see her. He moved away and joined a group of boys and girls and began to talk. Soon he observed that she was tripping gaily back and forth with flushed face and dancing eyes, pretending to be busy chasing schoolmates, and screaming with laughter when she made a capture. But he noticed that she always made her captures in his vicinity, and that she seemed to cast a conscious eye in his direction at such times, too. It gratified all the vicious vanity that was in him, and so, instead of winning him, it only set him up the more, and made him the more diligent to avoid betraying that he knew she was about. Presently she gave over skylarking, and moved irresolutely about, sighing once or twice, and glancing furtively and wistfully toward Tom. Then she observed that now Tom was talking more particularly to Amy Lawrence than to anyone else. She felt a sharp pang, and grew disturbed and uneasy at once. She tried to go away, but her feet were treacherous, and carried her to the group instead. She said to a girl almost at Tom's elbow, with sham vivacity, 
Why, Mary Austin, you bad girl, why didn't you come to Sunday school? I did come, didn't you see me? Why, no, did you? Where did you sit? I was in Miss Peter's class, where I always go. I saw you. Did you? Why, it's funny, I didn't see you. I wanted to tell you about the picnic. Oh, that's jolly. Who's going to give it? My ma's going to let me have one. Oh, goody, I hope she'll let me come. Well, she will. The picnic's for me. She'll let anybody come that I want, and I want you. That's ever so nice. When is it going to be? By and by. Maybe about vacation. Oh, won't it be fun? You going to have all the girls and boys? Yes, every one that's friends to me, or wants to be. And she glanced ever so furtively at Tom. But he talked right along to Amy Lawrence about the terrible storm on the island, and how the lightning tore the great sycamore tree all to flinders while he was standing within three feet of it. Oh, may I come? said Gracie Miller. Yes. And me? said Sally Rogers. Yes. And me too? said Susie Harper. And Joe? Yes. And so on, with clapping of joyful hands till all the group had begged for invitations but Tom and Amy. Then Tom turned coolly away, still talking, and took Amy with him. Becky's lips trembled, and the tears came to her eyes. She hid these signs with a forced gaiety and went on chattering, but the life had gone out of the picnic now, and out of everything else. She got away as soon as she could, and hid herself, and had what her sex call a good cry. Then she sat moody with wounded pride till the bell rang. She roused up now with a vindictive cast in her eye, and gave her plated tails a shake, and said she knew what she'd do. At recess Tom continued his flirtation with Amy with jubilant self-satisfaction, and he kept drifting about to find Becky and lacerate her with a performance. At last he spied her, but there was a sudden falling of his mercury. She was sitting cozily on a little bench behind the schoolhouse looking at a picture-book with Alfred Temple, and so absorbed were they, and their heads so close together over the book, that they did not seem to be conscious of anything in the world besides. Jealousy ran red-hot through Tom's veins. He began to hate himself for throwing away the chance Becky had offered for a reconciliation. He called himself a fool, and all the hard names he could think of. He wanted to cry with vexation. Amy chatted happily along as they walked, for her heart was singing, but Tom's tongue had lost its function. He did not hear what Amy was saying, and whenever she paused expectantly he could only stammer an awkward assent, which was as often misplaced as otherwise. He kept drifting to the rear of the schoolhouse again and again to sear his eyeballs with a hateful spectacle there. He could not help it, and it maddened him to see, as he thought he saw, that Becky Thatcher never once suspected that he was even in the land of the living. But she did see, nevertheless, and she knew she was winning her fight, too, and was glad to see him suffer as she had suffered. Amy's happy prattle became intolerable. Tom hinted at things he had to attend to, things that must be done, and time was fleeting. But in vain the girl chirped on. Tom thought, "'Oh, hang her! Ain't I ever going to get rid of her?' At last he must be attending to those things, and she said artlessly that she would be around when school left out, and he hastened away, hating her for it. "'Any other boy,' Tom thought, grating his teeth, any boy in the whole town but that St. Louis smarty that thinks he dresses so fine and is aristocracy. Oh, all right, I licked you the first day you ever saw this town, mister, and I'll lick you again. You just wait till I catch you out. I'll just take and—' And he went through the motions of thrashing an imaginary boy, pummeling the air and kicking and gouging. Oh, you do, do you? You holler enough, do you? Now, then, let that learn you. And so the imaginary flogging was finished to his satisfaction. Tom fled home at noon. His conscience could not endure any more of Amy's grateful happiness, and his jealousy could bear no more of the other distress. Becky resumed her picture inspections with Alfred, but as the minutes dragged along and no Tom came to suffer, her triumph began to cloud, and she lost interest. Gravity and absent-mindedness followed, and then melancholy. Two or three times she pricked up her ear at a footstep, but it was a false hope. No Tom came. At last she grew entirely miserable, and wished she hadn't carried it so far. When poor Alfred, seeing that he was losing her, he did not know how, kept exclaiming, "'Oh, here's a jolly one! Look at this!' She lost patience at last, and said, "'Oh, don't bother me! I, I don't care for them!' and burst into tears, and got up and walked away. Alfred dropped alongside, and was going to try to comfort her, but she said, "'Go away, and leave me alone, can't you? I hate you!' So the boy halted, wondering what he could have done. 
for she had said she would look at pictures all through the nooning, and she walked on crying. Then Alfred went musing into the deserted schoolhouse. He was humiliated and angry. He easily guessed his way to the truth. The girl had simply made a convenience of him, to vent her spite upon Tom Sawyer. He was far from hating Tom the less when this thought occurred to him. He wished there was some way to get that boy into trouble without much risk to himself. Tom's spelling-book fell under his eye. Here was his opportunity. He gratefully opened to the lesson for the afternoon and poured ink upon the page. Becky, glancing in at a window behind him at the moment, saw the act and moved on without discovering herself. She started homeward now, intending to find Tom and tell him. Tom would be thankful and their troubles would be healed. Before she was halfway home, however, she had changed her mind. The thought of Tom's treatment of her when she was talking about her picnic came scorching back and filled her with shame. She resolved to let him get whipped on the damaged spelling-book's account, and to hate him forever into the bargain. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 The Cruelty of I Didn't Think Tom arrived at home in a dreary mood, and the first thing his aunt said to him showed him that he had brought his sorrows to an unpromising market. "'Tom, I've a notion to skin you alive.' "'Auntie, what have I done?' "'Well, you've done enough. Here I go over to Serenity Harper like an old softy, expecting I'm going to make her believe all that rubbish about that dream, when, lo and behold you, she'd found out from Joe that you was over here and heard all the talk we had that night. Tom, I don't know what is to become of a boy that will act like that. It makes me feel so bad to think that you could let me go to Serenity Harper and make such a fool of myself and never say a word." This was a new aspect of the thing. His smartness of the morning had seemed to Tom a good joke before and very ingenious. It merely looked mean and shabby now. He hung his head and could not think of anything to say for a moment. Then he said, "'Auntie, I wished I hadn't done it, but I didn't think.' Oh, child, you never think. You never think of anything but your own selfishness. You could think to come all the way over here from Jackson's Island in the night to laugh at our troubles, and you could think to fool me with a lie about a dream, but you couldn't ever think to pity us and save us from sorrow. Auntie, I know now it was mean, but I didn't mean it to be mean. I didn't, honest. And besides, I didn't come over here to laugh at you that night. What did you come for, then? It was to tell you not to be uneasy about us, because we hadn't got drowned. Tom, Tom, I would be the thankfulest soul in this world if I could believe you ever had as good a thought as that. But you know you never did, and I know it, Tom. Indeed, indeed, I did, Addie. I, I wish I may never stir if I didn't. Oh, Tom, don't lie. Don't do it. It only makes things a hundred times worse. It ain't a lie, Addie. It's the truth. I wanted to keep you from grieving. That was all that made me come. I'd give the whole world to believe that. It would cover up a power of sins, Tom. I'd most be glad you'd run off and acted so bad. But it ain't reasonable. Because why didn't you tell me, child? Why, you see, when you got to talking about the funeral, I just got all full of the idea of our coming and hiding in the church, and I couldn't somehow bear to spoil it. So I just put the bark back in my pocket and kept mum. What bark? The bark I wrote on to tell you we'd gone pirating. I wished now you'd waked up when I kissed you. I do, honest. The hard lines in his aunt's face relaxed, and a sudden tenderness dawned in her eyes. Did you kiss me, Tom? Why, yes, I did. Are you sure you did, Tom? Why, yes, I did, Auntie, certain sure. What did you kiss me for, Tom? Because I loved you so, and you laid there moaning, and I was so sorry. The words sounded like truth. The old lady could not hide a tremor in her voice when she said, "'Kiss me again, Tom, and be off with you to school now, and don't bother me any more.' The moment he was gone, she ran to a closet and got out the ruin of a jacket which Tom had gone pirating in. Then she stopped with it in her hand and said to herself, "'No, I don't dare. Poor boy, I reckon he'd lied about it. But it's a blessed, blessed lie. There's such a comfort come from it.' I hope the Lord, I know the Lord, will forgive him, because it was such good-heartedness in him to tell it. But I don't want to find out it's a lie. I won't look." She put the jacket away and stood by, musing a minute. Twice she put out her hand to take the garment again, and twice she refrained. Once more she ventured, and this time she fortified herself with a thought, "'It's a good lie. It's a good lie. I won't let it grieve me.' So she sought the jacket pocket. 
A moment later she was reading Tom's piece of bark through the flowing tears and saying, I forgive the boy now if he'd committed a million sins. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 Tom Takes Becky's Punishment There was something about Aunt Polly's manner when she kissed Tom that swept away his low spirits and made him light-hearted and happy again. He started to school and had the luck of coming upon Becky Thatcher at the head of Meadow Lane. His mood always determined his manner. Without a moment's hesitation he ran to her and said, "'I acted mighty mean today, Becky, and I'm so sorry. I won't ever, ever do that way again. As long as I ever live, please make up, won't you?' The girl stopped and looked at him scornfully in the face. "'I'll thank you to keep yourself to yourself, Mr. Thomas Sawyer. I'll never speak to you again.' She tossed her head and passed on. Tom was so stunned that he had not even presence of mind enough to say, "'Who cares, Miss Smarty?' until the right time to say it had gone by. So he said nothing. But he was in a fine rage, nevertheless. He moped into the schoolyard, wishing she were a boy, and imagining how he would trounce her if she were. He presently encountered her and delivered a stinging remark as he passed. She hurled one in return, and the angry breach was complete. It seemed to Becky, in her hot resentment, that she could hardly wait for school to take in. She was so impatient to see Tom flogged for the injured spelling-book. If she had had any lingering notion of exposing Alfred Temple, Tom's offensive fling had driven it entirely away. Poor girl! She did not know how fast she was nearing trouble herself. The master, Mr. Dobbins, had reached middle age with an unsatisfied ambition. The darling of his desires was to be a doctor, but poverty had decreed that he should be nothing higher than a village schoolmaster. Every day he took a mysterious book out of his desk and absorbed himself in it at times when no classes were reciting. He kept that book under lock and key. There was not an urchin in school, but was perishing to have a glimpse of it, but the chance never came. Every boy and girl had a theory about the nature of that book, but no two theories were alike, and there was no way of getting at the facts in the case. Now, as Becky was passing by the desk, which stood near the door, she noticed that the key was in the lock. It was a precious moment. She glanced around, found herself alone, and the next instant she had the book in her hands. The title page, Professor Somebody's Anatomy, carried no information to her mind, so she began to turn the leaves. She came at once upon a handsomely engraved and colored frontispiece, a human figure, stark naked. At that moment a shadow fell on the page, and Tom Sawyer stepped in at the door and caught the glimpse of the picture. Becky snatched at the book to close it, and had the hard luck to tear the pictured plate half down the middle. She thrust the volumes into the desk, turned the key, and burst out crying with shame and vexation. "'Tom Sawyer, you are just as mean as you can be to sneak up on a person and, and look at what they're looking at. How could I know you was looking at anything? You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Tom Sawyer. You know you're going to tell on me, and I—I—what shall I do? What, what shall I do? I'll be whipped, and I never was whipped in school.' Then she stamped her little foot and said, "'Be so mean if you want to. I know something that's going to happen. You just wait, and you'll see.' Hateful, 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 and she flung out of the house with a new explosion of crying. Tom stood still, rather flustered by this onslaught. Presently he said to himself, What a curious kind of a fool a girl is. Never been licked in school. Shucks, what's a lickin'? That's just like a girl. They're so thin-skinned and chicken-hearted. Well, of course, I ain't going to tell old Dobbins on this little fool, because there's other ways of getting even on her that ain't so mean. But what of it? Old Dobbins will ask who it was tore his book. Nobody will answer. Then he'll do just the way he always does, ask first one, then t'other, and when he comes to the right girl he'll know it, without any telling. Girls' faces always tell on them. They ain't got any backbone. She'll get licked. Well, it's a kind of a tight place for Becky Thatcher, because there ain't any way out of it. Tom conned the thing a moment longer, and then added, All right, though. She'd like to see me in such a fix. Let her sweat it out. Tom joined the mob of skylarking scholars outside. In a few moments the master arrived, and school took in. Tom did not feel a strong interest in his studies. Every time he stole a glance at the girl's side of the room, Becky's face troubled him. Considering all things, he did not want to pity her, and yet it was all he could do to help it. He could get up no exaltation that was really worthy the name. Presently the spelling-book discovery was made, and Tom's mind was entirely full of his own matters for a while after that. Becky roused up from her lethargy of distress and showed good interest in the proceedings. She did not expect that Tom could get out of his trouble by denying that he spilt the ink on the book himself, and she was right. 
The denial only seemed to make the thing worse for Tom. Becky supposed she would be glad of that, and she tried to believe she was glad of it, but she found she was not certain. When the worst came to the worst, she had an impulse to get up and tell on Alfred Temple. But she made an effort, and forced herself to keep still, because, said she to herself, he'll tell about me tearing the book, sure. I wouldn't say a word not to save his life. Tom took his whipping and went back to his seat, not at all broken-hearted, for he thought it was possible that he had unknowingly upset the ink on the spelling-book himself in some skylarking bout. He had denied it for form's sake, and because it was custom, and had stuck to the denial from principle. A whole hour drifted by, the master sat nodding in his throne, the air was drowsy with the hum of study. By and by Mr. Dobbin straightened himself up, yawned, and then unlocked his desk and reached for his book, but seemed undecided whether to take it out or leave it. Most of the pupils glanced up languidly, but there was two among them that watched his movements with intent eyes. Mr. Dobbins fingered his book absently for a while, then took it out and settled himself in his chair to read. Tom shot a glance at Becky. He had seen a hunted and helpless rabbit look as she did, with a gun leveled at its head. Instantly he forgot his quarrel with her. Quick! Something must be done! Done in a flash, too! But the very imminence of the emergency paralyzed his invention. Good! He had an inspiration. He would run and snatch the book, spring through the door, and fly. But his resolution shook for one little instant, and the chance was lost. The master opened the volume. If Tom only had the wasted opportunity back again, too late. There was no help for Becky now, he said. The next moment the master faced the school. Every eye sank under his gaze. There was that in it which smote even the innocent with fear. There was silence while one might count ten. The master was gathering his wrath. Then he spoke. Who tore this book? There was not a sound. One could have heard a pin drop. The stillness continued. The master searched face after face for signs of guilt. Benjamin Rogers, did you tear this book? A denial. Another pause. Joseph Harper, did you? Another denial. Tom's uneasiness grew more and more intense under the slow torture of these proceedings. The master scanned the ranks of boys, considered a while, then turned to the girls. Amy Lawrence, a shake of the head. Gracie Miller, the same sign. Susan Harper, did you do this? Another negative. The next girl was Becky Thatcher. Tom was trembling from head to foot, with excitement and a sense of hopelessness of the situation. Rebecca Thatcher, Tom glanced at her face, it was white with terror. Did you tear? No, look me in the face. Her hands rose in appeal. Did you tear this book? A thought shot like lightning through Tom's brain. He sprang to his feet and shouted, I done it! The school stared in perplexity at this incredible folly. Tom stood a moment to gather his dismembered faculties, and when he stepped forward to go to his punishment, the surprise, the gratitude, the adoration that shone upon him out of poor Becky's eyes seemed pay enough for a hundred floggings. Inspired by the splendor of his own act, he took without an outcry the most merciless flaying that even Mr. Dobbins had ever administered, and also received with indifference the added cruelty of a command to remain two hours after school should be dismissed for he knew who would wait for him outside till his captivity was done, and not count the tedious time as loss, either. Tom went to bed that night planning vengeance against Alfred Temple, for with shame and repentance Becky had told him all, not forgetting her own treachery, but even the longing for vengeance had to give way soon to pleasanter musings, and he fell asleep at last, with Becky's latest words lingering dreamily in his ear. Tom. How could you be so noble? End of chapter 20 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain Chapter 21 Eloquence and the Master's Gilded Dome Vacation was approaching. The schoolmaster, always severe, grew severer, and more exacting than ever, for he wanted the school to make a good showing on examination day. His rod and his ferrule were seldom idle now, at least among the smaller pupils. Only the biggest boys and young ladies of eighteen and twenty escaped lashing. Mr. Dobbin's lashings were very vigorous ones, too 
for although he carried under his wig a perfectly bald and shiny head he had only reached middle age, and there was no sign of feebleness in his muscle. As the great day approached, all the tyranny that was in him came to the surface. He seemed to take a vindictive pleasure in punishing the least shortcomings. The consequence was that the smaller boys spent their days in terror and suffering, and their nights in plotting revenge. They threw away no opportunity to do the master a mischief, but he kept ahead all the time. The retribution that followed every vengeful success was so sweeping and majestic that the boys always retired from the field badly worsted. At last they conspired together and hit upon a plan that promised a dazzling victory. They swore in the sign-painter's boy, told him the scheme, and asked his help. He had his own reason for being delighted, for the master boarded in his father's family, and had given the boy ample cause to hate him. The master's wife would go on a visit to the country in a few days, and there would be nothing to interfere with the plan. The master always prepared himself for great occasions by getting pretty well fuddled, and the sign-painter's boy said that when the dominie had reached the proper condition on examination evening, he would manage the thing, while he napped in his chair. Then he would have him awakened at the right time, and hurried away to school. In the fullness of time the interesting occasion arrived. At eight in the evening the schoolhouse was brilliantly lighted, and adorned with wreaths and festoons of foliage and flowers. The master sat throned in his great chair upon a raised platform with his blackboard behind him. He was looking tolerably mellow. Three rows of benches on each side, and six rows in front of him, were occupied by the dignitaries of the town, and by the parents of the pupils. To his left, back of the rows of citizens, was a spacious temporary platform upon which were seated the scholars, who were to take part in the exercises of the evening. Rows of small boys, washed and dressed to an intolerable state of discomfort, rows of gawky big boys, snowbanks of girls and young ladies clad in lawn and muslin and conspicuously conscious of their bare arms, their grandmother's ancient trinkets, their bits of pink and blue ribbon, and the flowers in their hair. All the rest of the house was filled with non-participating scholars. The exercises began. A very little boy stood up and sheepishly recited, "'You'd scarce expect one of my age to speak in public on the stage,' etc., accompanying himself with the painfully exact and spasmodic gestures which a machine might have used, supposing the machine to be a trifle out of order. But he got through safely, though cruelly scared, and got a fine round of applause when he made his manufactured bow and retired. A little shamefaced girl lisped, "'Mary had a little lamb,' etc., performed a compassion-inspired curtsy, got her meed of applause, and sat down flushed and happy. Tom Sawyer stepped forward with conceited confidence, and soared into the unquenchable and indestructible "'Give me liberty or give me death!' speech, with fine fury and frantic gesticulation, and broke down in the middle of it. A ghastly stage-fright seized him. His legs quaked under him, and he was like to choke. True, he had the manifest sympathy of the house, but he had the house's silence, too, which was even worse than its sympathy. The master frowned, and this completed the disaster. Tom struggled a while, and then retired utterly defeated. There was a weak attempt at applause, but it died early. The boys stood on the burning deck, followed. Also, the Assyrian came down, and other declamatory gems. Then there were reading exercises and a spelling fight. The meagre Latin class recited with honor. The prime feature of the evening was in order now, original compositions by the young ladies. Each in her turn stepped forward to the edge of the platform, cleared her throat, held up her manuscript, tied with dainty ribbon, and proceeded to read, with labored attention to expression and punctuation. The themes were the same that had been illuminated upon similar occasions by their mothers before them, their grandmothers, and doubtless all their ancestors in the female line clear back to the Crusades. Friendship was one. Memories of other days. Religion in history. Dreamland. The advantages of culture. Forms of political government compared and contrasted. Melancholy. Filial love heart longings, etc., etc. A prevalent feature in these compositions was a nursed and petted melancholy, 
another was a wasteful and opulent gush of fine language another was a tendency to lug in by the ears particularly prized words and phrases until they were worn entirely out and a peculiarity that conspicuously marked and marred them was the inveterate and intolerable sermon that wagged its crippled tail at the end of each and every one of them no matter what the subject might be a brain-racking effort was made to squirm it into some aspect or other that the moral and religious mind could contemplate with edification the glaring insincerity of these sermons was not sufficient to compass the banishment of the fashion from the schools and it is not sufficient to-day it never will be sufficient while the world stands perhaps there is no school in all our land where the young ladies do not feel obliged to close their compositions with a sermon and you will find that the sermon of the most frivolous and the least religious girl in the school is always the longest and the most relentlessly pious but enough of this homely truth is unpalatable let us return to the examination the first composition that was read was one entitled is this then life perhaps the reader can endure and extract from it in the common walks of life with what delightful emotions does the youthful mind look forward to some anticipated scene of festivity imagination is busy sketching rose-tinted pictures of joy in fancy the voluptuous votary of fashion sees herself amid the festive throng the observed of all observers her graceful form arrayed in snowy robes is whirling through the mazes of the joyous dance her eye is brightest her step is lightest in the gay assembly in such delicious fancies time quickly glides by and the welcome hour arrives for her entrance into the elysian world of which she has had such bright dreams how fairy-like does everything appear to her enchanted vision each new scene is more charming than the last but after a while she finds that beneath this goodly exterior all is vanity the flattery which once charmed her soul now grates harshly upon her ear the ballroom has lost its charms and with wasted health and embittered heart she turns away with the conviction that earthly pleasures cannot satisfy the longings of the soul and so forth and so on there was a buzz of gratification from time to time during the reading accompanied by whispered ejaculations of how sweet how eloquent so true etc and after the thing had closed with a peculiarly afflicting sermon the applause was enthusiastic then arose a slight melancholy girl whose face had the interesting paleness that comes of pills and indigestion and read a poem two stanzas of it will do a missouri maiden's farewell to alabama alabama good-bye i love thee well but yet for a while do i leave thee now sad yes sad thoughts of thee my heart doth swell and burning recollections throng my brow for i have wandered through thy flowery woods have roamed and read near tallapoosa's stream have listened to tallacy's warring floods and wooed on coosa's side aurora's beam yet shame i not to bear an oarful heart nor blush to turn behind my tearful eyes tis from no stranger land i now must part tis to no strangers left i yield these sighs welcome and home were mine within this state whose veils i leave whose spires fade fast from me and cold must be mine eyes and heart and tete when dear alabama they turn cold on thee there were very few there who knew what tet meant but the poem was very satisfactory nevertheless next appeared a dark-complexioned black-eyed black-haired young lady who paused an impressive moment assumed a tragic expression and began to read in a measured solemn tone a vision dark and tempestuous was night around the throne on high not a single star quivered but the deep intonations of the heavy thunder constantly vibrated upon the ear whilst the terrific lightning revelled in angry mood through the cloudy chambers of heaven seeming to scorn the power exerted over its terror by the illustrious franklin even the boisterous winds unanimously came forth from their mystic homes and blustered about as if to enhance by their aid the wildness of the scene at such a time so dark so dreary for human sympathy my very spirit sighed but instead thereof 
my dearest friend my counsellor my comforter and guide my joy in grief my second bliss in joy came to my side she moved like one of those bright beings pictured in the sunny walks of fancy's eden by the romantic and young a queen of beauty unadorned save by her own transcendent loveliness so soft was her step it failed to make even a sound and but for the magical thrill imparted by her genial touch as other unobtrusive beauties she would have glided away unperceived unsought a strange sadness rested upon her features like icy tears upon the robe of december as she pointed to the contending elements without and bade me contemplate the two beings presented this nightmare occupied some ten pages of manuscript and wound up with a sermon so destructive of all hope to non-presbyterians that it took the first prize this composition was considered to be the very finest effort of the evening the mayor of the village in delivering the prize to the author of it made a warm speech in which he said that it was by far the most eloquent thing he had ever listened to and that daniel webster himself might well be proud of it it may be remarked in passing that the number of compositions in which the word beauteous was over fondled and human experience referred to as life's pages was up to the usual average now the master mellow almost to the verge of geniality put his chair aside turned his back to the audience and began to draw a map of america on the blackboard to exercise the geography class upon but he made a sad business of it with his unsteady hand and a smothered titter rippled over the house he knew what the matter was and set himself to write it he sponged out lines and remade them but he only distorted them more than ever and the tittering was more pronounced he threw his entire attention upon his work now as if determined not to be put down by the mirth he felt that all eyes were fastened upon him he imagined he was succeeding and yet the tittering continued it even manifestly increased and well it might there was a garret above pierced with a scuttle over his head and down through this scuttle came a cat suspended around the haunches by a string she had a rag tied about her head and jaws to keep her from mewing as she slowly descended she curved upward and clawed at the string she swung downward and clawed at the intangible air the tittering rose higher and higher the cat was within six inches of the absorbed teacher's head down down a little lower and she grabbed his wig with her desperate claws clung to it and was snatched up into the garret in an instant with her trophy still in her possession and how the light did blaze abroad from the master's bald pate for the sign painter's boy had gilded it that broke up the meeting the boys were avenged vacation had come note the pretended compositions quoted in this chapter are taken without alteration from a volume entitled prose and poetry by a western lady but they are exactly and precisely after the schoolgirl pattern and hence are much happier than any mere imitations could be end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two huck finn quotes scriptures tom joined the new order of cadets of temperance being attracted by the showy character of their regalia he promised to abstain from smoking chewing and profanity as long as he remained a member now he found out a new thing namely that to promise not to do a thing is the surest way in the world to make a body want to go and do that very thing tom soon found himself tormented with a desire to drink and swear the desire grew to be so intense that nothing but the hope of a chance to display himself in his red sash kept him from withdrawing from the order. Fourth of July was coming, but he soon gave that up, gave it up before he had worn his shackles over forty-eight hours, and fixed his hopes upon old Judge Fraser, Justice of the Peace, who was apparently on his deathbed and would have a big public funeral, since he was so high an official. During three days Tom was deeply concerned about the judge's condition and hungry for news of it. Sometimes his hopes ran high, so high that he would venture to get out his regalia and practice before the looking-glass. But the judge had a most discouraging way of fluctuating. At last he was pronounced upon the mend, and then convalescent. Tom was disgusted, and felt a sense of injury, too. 
He handed in his resignation at once, and that night the judge suffered a relapse and died. Tom resolved that he would never trust a man like that again. The funeral was a fine thing. The cadets paraded in a style calculated to kill the late member with envy. Tom was a free boy again, however. There was something in that. He could drink and swear now, but found to his surprise that he did not want to. The simple fact that he could took the desire away and the charm of it. Tom presently wondered to find that his coveted vacation was beginning to hang a little heavily on his hands. He attempted a diary, but nothing happened during three days, and so he abandoned it. The first of all the negro minstrel shows came to town, and made a sensation. Tom and Joe Harper got up a band of performers and were happy for two days. Even the glorious fourth was in some sense a failure, for it rained hard, there was no procession in consequence, and the greatest man in the world, as Tom supposed, Mr. Benton, an actual United States Senator, proved an overwhelming disappointment, for he was not twenty-five feet high, nor even anywhere in the neighborhood of it. A circus came. The boys played circus for three days afterward in tents made of rag-carpeting. Admission, three pins for boys, two for girls, and then circusing was abandoned. A phrenologist and a mesmerizer came, and went again, and left the village duller and drearier than ever. There were some boys' and girls' parties, but they were so few and so delightful that they only made the aching voids between ache the harder. Becky Thatcher was gone to her Constantinople home to stay with her parents during vacation, so there was no bright side to life anywhere. The dreadful secret of the murder was a chronic misery. It was a very cancer for permanency and pain. Then came the measles. During two long weeks Tom lay a prisoner, dead to the world and its happenings. He was very ill. He was interested in nothing. When he got upon his feet at last and moved feebly downtown, a melancholy change had come over everything and every creature. There had been a revival, and everybody had got religion, not only the adults, but even the boys and girls. Tom went about, hoping against hope for the sight of one blessed sinful face, but disappointment crossed him everywhere. He found Joe Harper studying a testament, and turned sadly away from the depressing spectacle. He sought Ben Rogers, and found him visiting the poor with a basket of tracts. He hunted up Jim Hollis, who called his attention to the precious blessing of his late measles as a warning. Every boy he encountered added another ton to his depression, and when, in desperation, he flew for refuge at last to the bosom of Huckleberry Finn, and was received with a scriptural quotation, his heart broke and he crept home and to bed, realizing that he alone of all the town was lost forever and forever. And that night there came on a terrific storm, with driving rain, awful claps of thunder, and blinding sheets of lightning. He covered his head with his bedclothes, and waited in a horror of suspense for his doom, for he had not the shadow of a doubt that all this hubbub was about him. He believed he had taxed the forbearance of the powers above to the extremity of endurance, and that this was the result. It might have seemed to him a waste of pomp and ammunition to kill a bug with a battery of artillery, but there seemed nothing incongruous about the getting up such an expensive thunderstorm as this to knock the turf from under an insect like himself. By and by the tempest spent itself and died without accomplishing its object. The boy's first impulse was to be grateful and reform. His second was to wait, for there might not be any more storms. The next day the doctors were back. Tom had relapsed. The three weeks he spent on his back this time seemed an entire age. When he got abroad at last he was hardly grateful that he had been spared, remembering how lonely was his estate, how companionless and forlorn he was. He drifted listlessly down the street and found Jim Hollis acting as judge in a juvenile court that was trying a cat for murder, in the presence of her victim, a bird. He found Joe Harper and Huck Finn up an alley eating a stolen melon. Poor lads, they, like Tom, had suffered a relapse. End of chapter twenty two. Chapter twenty three. The Salvation of Muff Potter. At last the sleepy atmosphere was stirred, and vigorously the murder trial came on in the court. It became the absorbing topic of village talk immediately. Tom could not get away from it. Every reference to the murder sent a shudder to his heart. 
for his troubled conscience and fears almost persuaded him that these remarks were put forth in his hearing as feelers. He did not see how he could be suspected of knowing anything about the murder, but still he could not be comfortable in the midst of this gossip. It kept him in a cold shiver all the time. He took Huck to a lonely place to have a talk with him. It would be some relief to unseal his tongue for a little while, to divide his burden of distress with another sufferer. Moreover, he wanted to assure himself that Huck had remained discreet. "'Huck, have you ever told anybody about—that? About what? You know what? Oh, cor course I haven't. Never a word? Never a solitary word, so help me. What makes you ask?' "'Well, I was afeard. Why, Tom Sawyer, we wouldn't be alive two days if that got found out. You know that.' Tom felt more comfortable. After a pause, "'Huck, they couldn't anybody get you to tell, could they?' "'Get me to tell? Why, if I wanted that half-breed devil to drown me, they could get me to tell. They ain't no different way.' "'Well, that's all right, then. I reckon we're safe as long as we keep mum.' but let's swear again, anyway. It's more sure." I'm agreed. So they swore again, with dread solemnities. What is the talk around, Huck? I've heard a power of it. Talk? Well, it's just Muff Potter, Muff Potter, Muff Potter all the time. It keeps me in a sweat, constant, so as I want to hide somewheres. That's just the same way they go on round me. I reckon he's a goner. Don't you feel sorry for him sometimes? Most always, most always. He ain't no account, but then he ain't ever done anything to hurt anybody. Just fishes a little, to get money to get drunk on, and loafs around considerable. But, Lord, we all do that, leastways most of us, preachers and such like. But he's kind of good. He give me half a fish once, when there weren't enough for two. And lots of times he's kind of stood by me when I was out of luck. Well, he's mended kites for me, Huck, and knitted hooks onto my line. I, I wish we could get him out of there. My, we couldn't get him out, Tom, and besides, twouldn't do any good. They'd catch him again. Yes, so they would. But I hate to hear him abuse him so like the dickens when he never done that. I do too, Tom. Lord, I hear him say he's the bloodiest looking villain in this country, and they wonder he wasn't ever hung before. Yes, they talk like that all the time. I've heard him say that if he was to get free, they'd lynch him. And they'd do it, too. The boys had a long talk, but it brought them little comfort. As the twilight drew on, they found themselves hanging about the neighborhood of the little isolated jail, perhaps with an undefined hope that something would happen that might clear away their difficulties. But nothing happened. There seemed to be no angels or fairies interested in this luckless captive. The boys did as they had often done before, went to the cell grating, and gave Potter some tobacco and matches. He was on the ground floor, and there were no guards. His gratitude for their gifts had always smote their conscience before. It cut deeper than ever this time. They felt cowardly and treacherous to the last degree when Potter said, "'You've been mighty good to me, boys, better than anybody else in this town. And I don't forget it, I don't. Often I says to myself, says I, I used to mend all the boys' kites and things, and show em where the good fishing places was, and befriend em what I could. And now they've all forgot old Muff, when he's in trouble. But Tom don't, and Huck don't. They don't forget him, says I, and I don't forget them. Well, boys, I had done an awful thing. Drunk and crazy at the time. That's the only way I count for it. And now I got to swing for it. And it's right. Right. And best, too, I reckon. I hope so, anyway. Well, we won't talk about that. I don't want to make you feel bad. You've befriended me. But what I want to say is, don't you ever get drunk. Then you won't ever get here. Stand a little further west, so that's it. It's a prime comfort to see faces that's friendly when a body's in such a muck of trouble, and there don't none come here but yourn. Good friendly faces, good friendly faces. Get up on one other's backs and and let me touch em. That's it. Shake hands. Yourn'll come through the bars, but mine's too big. Little hands and weak, and they've helped Muff Potter a power and they'd help him more if they could. Tom went home miserable, and his dreams that night were full of horrors. The next day and the day after he hung about the courtroom, drawn by an impossible irresistible impulse to go in, but forcing himself to stay out. Huck was having the same experience. They studiously avoided each other. 
each wandered away from time to time, but the same dismal fascination always brought them back presently. Tom kept his ears open when idlers sauntered out of the courtroom, but invariably heard distressing news. The toils were closing more and more relentlessly around poor Potter. At the end of the second day the village talk was to the effect that Injun Joe's evidence stood firm and unshaken, and that there was not the slightest question as to what the jury's verdict would be. Tom was out late that night, and came to bed through the window. He was in a tremendous state of excitement. It was hours before he got to sleep. All the village flocked to the courthouse the next morning, for this was to be the great day. Both sexes were about equally represented in the packed audience. After a long wait the jury filed in and took their places. Shortly afterward Potter, pale and haggard, timid and hopeless, was brought in, with chains upon him, and seated where all the curious eyes could stare at him. No less conspicuous was Injun Joe, stolid as ever. There was another pause, and then the judge arrived and the sheriff proclaimed the opening of the court. The usual whisperings among the lawyers and gathering together of papers followed. These details and accompanying delays worked up an atmosphere of preparation that was as impressive as it was fascinating. Now a witness was called who testified that he found Muff Potter washing in the brook at an early hour of the morning that the murder was discovered, and that he immediately sneaked away. After some further questioning, counsel for the prosecution said, "'Take the witness.' The prisoner raised his eyes for a moment, but dropped them again, when his own counsel said, "'I have no questions to ask him.' The next witness proved the finding of the knife near the corpse. Counsel for the prosecution said, "'Take the witness.' "'I have no questions to ask him,' Potter's lawyer replied. A third witness swore he had often seen the knife in Potter's possession. "'Take the witness.' counsel for Potter declined to question him. The faces of the audience began to betray annoyance. Did this attorney mean to throw away his client's life without an effort? Several witnesses deposed concerning Potter's guilty behavior when brought to the scene of the murder. They were allowed to leave the stand without being cross-questioned. Every detail of the damaging circumstances that occurred in the graveyard upon that morning which all present remembered so well was brought out by credible witnesses, but none of them were cross-examined by Potter's lawyer. The perplexity and dissatisfaction of the house expressed itself in murmurs and provoked a reproof from the bench. Counsel for the prosecution now said, "'By the oaths of citizens whose simple word is above suspicion, we have fastened this awful crime, beyond all possibility of question, upon the unhappy prisoner at the bar. We rest our case here." A groan escaped from poor Potter, and he put his face in his hands and rocked his body softly to and fro, while a painful silence reigned in the courtroom. Many men were moved, and many women's compassion testified itself in tears. Counsel for the defense rose and said, your Honor, in our remarks at the opening of this trial, we foreshadowed our purpose to prove that our client did this fearful deed while under the influence of a blind and irresponsible delirium produced by drink. We have changed our mind. We shall not offer that plea. Then to the clerk, Call Thomas Sawyer. A puzzled amazement awoke in every face in the house, not even excepting Potter's. Every eye fastened itself with wondering interest upon Tom as he rose and took his place upon the stand. The boy looked wild enough, for he was badly scared. The oath was administered. "'Thomas Sawyer, where were you on the 17th of June, about the hour of midnight?' Tom glanced at Injun Joe's iron face, and his tongue failed him. The audience listened breathless, but the words refused to come. After a few moments, however, the boy got a little of his strength back, and managed to put enough of it into his voice to make part of the house hear. "'In the graveyard?' "'A little bit louder, please. Don't be afraid. You were in the graveyard.' A contemptuous smile flitted across Injun Joe's face. "'Were you anywhere near Horse William's grave?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Speak up. Just a trifle louder. How near were you?' "'Near as I am to you.' Were you hidden or not? I was hid. Where? Behind the elms that's on the edge of the grave. Injun Joe gave a barely perceptible start. Anyone with you? Yes, sir. I went there with— Wait, wait a moment. Never mind mentioning your companion's name. We will produce him at the proper time. 
Did you carry anything there with you? Tom hesitated and looked confused. Speak out, my boy. Don't be diffident. The truth is always respectable. What did you take there? Only, uh, uh, dead cat. There was a ripple of mirth which the court checked. We will produce the skeleton of that cat. Now, my boy, tell us everything that occurred. Tell it in your own way. Don't skip anything, and don't be afraid. Tom began hesitatingly at first, but as he warmed to his subject his words flowed more and more easily. In a little while every sound ceased but his own voice. Every eye fixed itself upon him. With parted lips and bated breath the audience hung upon his words, taking no note of time, wrapped in the ghastly fascination of the tale. The strain upon pent emotion reached its climax when the boy said, and as the doctor fetched the board around and muff potter fell injun joe jumped with a knife and crash quick as lightning the half-breed sprang for a window tore his way through all opposers and was gone end of chapter twenty three